Hi everyone, this is the first video in the development unit. This video will cover prenatal and infant development. As you can see, the videos that will follow will just cover different aspects of development over a lifespan. And there's also people under each section that are important to know from that particular video. So just make sure you take note of that as you are moving through the video. To start with, we will just start with some of the foundational terms when it comes to development. So first is one of the most important conversations in uh, human development, and that is nature versus nurture, which is just the question of what has a greater influence in who we are. Is it our inherited traits and our genetics, or is it our life experiences, the environmental factors? Which one plays a greater role in who we are? Nature is just referring to genetic and hereditary traits, whereas nurture is referring to the environmental factors such as parenting, social interactions, cultural influences, and which of those is playing a bigger role on who we are. Epigenetics is a newer concept and it's a newer study and epigenetics just refers to the way that environmental factors can actually have an influence on our gene expression and things that we are exposed to in the environment can actually turn on or turn off our gene expression and can influence that. So that means external factors can have an impact on our traits. So that's something that is a newer development in um, psychological understanding of our development. The last term on here is maturation, which is just a fancy way of saying maturing over time, and it's just another, another term for development. Uh, maturation just is the biological growth process and development. So it's just another one of those terms that means development. This would also be a great time for me to remind you of two terms that have come up in previous units. That is longitudinal studies and cross-sectional studies. So with development in particular, if we're studying a lifespan, um, we could use a longitudinal study or a cross-sectional study. A longitudinal study would be a study where you would, you would uh, watch and observe someone over a long period of time, possibly even decades. That would be a really long study, and that's, for me, easy to remember. Longitudinal is a long study. A cross-sectional study would be a study where you would want to do something like this, and you'd want to understand how something occurs over a long time frame, but you do this in a shorter time frame by following cross sections. So rather than following one person over their whole lifetime, I could follow cross sections. So um, I could follow preschoolers and then a group of, of elementary schoolers and then a group of uh, elementary and middle and high school, and I could follow that group over a shorter time span rather than following one person throughout their all of their, their school years. So those are some things just to keep in mind. If a term or concept comes up in multiple units, you might just want to make sure that you refresh yourself on that because that could be an important term to know for the test. Next is prenatal development and the stages of prenatal natal development. So this, these are terms typically that students are less familiar with, which are the three stages of prenatal development. So you might just try to come up with a tool to help yourself remember the stages. The first one is a zygote, and zygote is the very first stage of prenatal development, and this occurs within the first two weeks. So this is rapid cell division. After two weeks, the zygote becomes an embryo and an embryo is the second stage of development this is from two weeks to about two months and this is the stage where organs begin to develop and the heart starts to beat the next is the fetus and this is the final stage of development this is where we're seeing uh, the embryo move into the final stages so nine weeks all the way to birth would be considered a fetus uh, and you can also see we've got a larger picture right here, which helps us better understand this term called the placenta. The placenta is this outer structure that surrounds the baby in the womb, and it provides oxygen, nutrients, and removes waste. So that's another term that comes up in this particular section. Something else you need to be aware of is the term teratogen. A teratogen is anything that can 
negatively impact the prenatal development. So this is something that is harmful. It could be a virus that the mother contracts. It could be um, prescription medications. It could be radiation, nicotine, alcohol. There's all kinds of things that the mother could be exposed to that could have a negative impact on the development of the child, and that would be called a teratogen. So something else that comes up in this unit is an example of what can occur when the mother is exposed to one of these teratogens, and that is fetal alcohol syndrome. And this is something that occurs with the child who um, was in the womb when the mother was exposed to alcohol. And this is just going to result in physical or cognitive abnormalities um, with the child if the mother has consumed um, alcohol during the pregnancy. And sometimes depending on the stage, it can impact different areas of development. Whatever was developing during that stage could be impaired. So next is the newborn reflexes. And newborn reflexes are just involuntary actions that the baby is born with. And these actions range from all different kinds of abilities. Uh, the first one is the rooting reflex. And so whenever the baby's cheek is stroked, the baby will turn and open its mouth. And that reflex just helps the child uh, begin to have this, to, to feed. And this lasts about four months. So if the child is touched on the cheek, it'll turn and open its mouth. The next is the gripping. You can see that on there. If you um, touch the child's palm, they'll latch on to your finger. The toe curling or the Babinski, if you stroke their, their foot, their toes will curl. The Moro or the startle reflex is just a reflex that happens with, when a loud sound or a movement occurs and the baby throws its arms and its head back. And um, this reflex lasts till they're about two months old. Um, the next you can see is this neck flex where it kind of like turns and stretches. Um, this lasts really several months, let's tell her about five months old. Um, and all of these reflexes, what they're doing is um, typically they are either leading to either um, help the child, either grasp their mother um, to start with the feeding process. Uh, one that's on here is the sucking, and sucking is a reflex that um, the baby is also born with to allow for the feeding process. Next is um, uh, something that is called critical periods, and critical periods are a time where a child is really sensitive to learning or acquiring uh, or developing some kind of skill, and they need to be exposed to that stimulus during that sensitive time. So one of these is imprinting, and this is an animal critical period and this is something that was studied by Conrad Lorenz and you can see him there with his geese and his ducks and what he learned was within the first 24 hours of a little duckling or gosling's um, birth, whatever the first thing that they see, they attach to as their mother. And so he learned that these ducks and geese would attach to him if he was the first thing that they saw. The next is Jeannie. Jeannie is an example of a case study. A case study is a situation where you learn from one person or one animal and then you can uh, project that information onto a greater population and you can make the inference that what happened to this person will occur in a, another population of people. Now we're not going to replicate this. Case studies are typically not able to be replicated and with Jeannie this is a great example of something that would not be replicated. Jeannie uh, experienced extreme abuse. She was locked in her room. Um, kept in a crib, strapped to a potty chair for most of her life. She was found at age 13 and it was believed that she was not exposed to language during that time period other than really negative um, grunts and yells from her father. So when she was taken in by um, 
by social services and then taken to researchers. They worked really hard with her, but she could never really acquire language. Um, she struggled to put, she was able to learn just a few words, but was not able to actually put together languages in a grammatical structure. And so it is believed that there is a critical period for language and it's sometime before the age of 13 um, in early childhood at some point. Next, we have uh, some people that help us understand the infant needs. So the first is, I actually put the pictures out of order. So Renee Spitz is right here. Renee Spitz did a study with children in orphanages. And what he found was ch these children in these Romanian orphanages were deprived of social interaction. They, it was an overcrowded orphanage. Uh, they had not enough nurses and to, to cover all of the children and they were fed, but they got very little affection. And what he noticed was that these children were missing developmental uh, markers. And so he called what, what was occurring a psychogenic disease. So he believed that missing this social interaction and this contact was actually influencing their physical development. And they were missing some of these very important milestones like crawling, um, babbling, um, rolling over, standing up. And so having that deprivation of, of contact and interaction was influencing their physical development. The next person is Harry Harlow and he is seen here. And Harry Harlow, he did a study with uh, infant monkeys and what he wanted to see was, um, he wanted to understand the uh, importance of having physical touch. And so he took the infant, Infant, infant monkeys away from their mothers and he replaced them with two surrogate mothers. One surrogate mother you can see here is very soft and you can see this little infant monkey is clinging onto the soft cloth of the surrogate mother. He had a second surrogate mother who had um, a bottle that could feed this um, infant monkey but it was a wire mother. It was not soft and what he found was the infant monkeys would cling on to the soft mother for hours and hours and hours at a time. And then only when they needed sustenance or food would they go over to the wire mother. They would get that milk and that sustenance and then they would leave and cling on to that cloth mother. And what he concluded was how important it was for those infant monkeys to have that soft touch um, and to have that physical touch. And when he put those infant monkeys into a new place, a new environment, and he put the wire monkey and the soft um, monkey into that new environment, the infant monkey was scared and so to get comfort he would run over and cling on to the soft mother and not the mother that was giving him food um, and that's where he got that security was from that touch and what we learn even with human babies is how, how important it is to have physical touch when a, a baby is born they will have the mother hold or even the father whoever is available hold skin to skin contact that newborn baby so that newborn baby can have that contact with the mother the next is uh, Mary Ainsworth and Mary Ainsworth studied attachment and how important an emotional t attachment was between an infant and a caregiver and she devised a situation called the strange situation to see what an infant's attachment was or a child's attachment was to their mother. So the strange situation was an experimental situation to determine what type of attachment the child had with its caregiver. So you can see here is the strange situation. Here is the mother, here is the child, and here is a stranger. So uh, a typical child with a secure attachment would be uh, feel comforted knowing that their mother was in this room with them in this strange environment. They'd use the mother as a secure base. They might even go over and touch the mother just for that comfort and then go back to play. They would be a little uneased with this stranger in the room, but the mother would give comfort to that child. That would be um, a child with a secure attachment to their mother. So the way the situation would work would be Mary Ainsworth. You can see her here in the picture. She would instruct the mother to leave the room and so the child would be with a stranger in the room. Naturally, this would cause stranger anxiety. Stranger anxiety occurs around eight months uh, of age where a child is very um, uh, <laughs> anxious around strangers. So this would be really natural for the child to be upset when the mother left the room. Now, really what Mary Ainsworth was concerned about was what happened when the mother returned. So a baby with a secure attachment 
would be comforted and happy when the, the mother returned. Uh, they would be, they would get over the distress because the mother returned. A child with an insecure attachment, when the mother would come into the room, they would not be comforted. They would be avoidant and frustrated and uh, they might try to punish the mother by pouting and looking away. And so this was really characteristic in, in finding out if there was a secure or insecure attachment between the mother and the caregiver. Guys, I'm out of time. I hope that